All right, welcome back to your organic chemistry lecture. We are continuing on into chapter six. Now, so far, what we've learned about is thermodynamics and kinetics, so mostly review from our previous semesters of general chemistry. Now what we're going to do is, it's a little bit of review, but uh, we're going to add some new terms, and these new terms are going to be really important for the rest of both this semester and your next semester of organic chemistry. So the two terms that we're going to define is going to be a uh, nucleophile and electrophile. So we'll get to that in just a second, but really all this is, is going to be, it's just a reframing of words that you already know. Um, nucleophiles and electrophiles are basically regions of high electron density and low electron density respectively. So you can recognize these because you already know how to identify polar areas of a molecule. So let's go ahead and let's, let's start with our review and then we'll get into the specifics, nucleophiles and electrophiles. So don't be intimidated by those new words. It's, it's already stuff that you know. So, uh, right, so starting this, basically a lot of organic chemistry reactions are gonna involve um, polar molecules one way or another. You may notice that when we reviewed a lot of the functional groups, they involve a lot of polar bonds and those polar bonds create areas of high electron density that carry a partial negative charge and areas of low electron density that carry a partial positive charge. So these polar reactions, if you have these partial negative and partial positive charges floating around in solution, they're naturally gonna uh, align with one another um, because they're attracted to each other electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetically, right? Um, positive charges attract negative charges and vice versa. So yeah, so that brings up like a couple examples of polar molecules here. So like for example, methyl chloride involves a carbon chlorine bond. Chlorine is more electronegative than carbon. So it pulls electron density from the carbon to itself, creating a partial positive charge on the, chlor uh, on the carbon, excuse me, and leading to a partial negative charge on the chlorine. So there shouldn't be, there's nothing new there in what I just said, right? I mean, that's stuff that you've heard a lot. Uh, another example would be, um, if you have a lithium carbon bond, which there's a few examples of it, they're very reactive, but they do exist. Uh, this lithium carbon bond, basically lithium is much less electronegative than carbon. So carbon's gonna pull the electron density to it almost as, uh, almost basically forming an ionic bond um, where the negative charge is localized on the carbon, almost. But in this case, you have a partial negative charge on this carbon and a partial positive charge on this carbon. Now, if you have a partial positive charge, as you can imagine, that attracts negative charges. So how we call this is this partial positive area that we've seen before in all of our general chemistry courses. We even tried identifying it back in chapter one and chapter two, looking for partial positive charges on molecules. And uh, we call this now electrophilic. It's an electrophilic region. The way that you can remember that is just think electrophilic is electron loving. That's Greek, right? Electro is for electron. Electrons are negatively charged. Philic means loving. So an electrophilic site loves negative charges. And what loves negative charges more than positive charges, right? On the other hand, in this case where we have lithium bonded to carbon, the carbon has a partial negative charge. So it's pulling electron density to it. This partial negative charge is gonna be attracted to other positive charges. So we call this nucleophilic. So nucleo for nucleus, the nucleus contains all the protons and the positive charge. So nucleus loving, so that means it's positive charge loving. In other words, it's partially negatively charged. Okay, and just kind of like to, to re-emphasize this point, because that was like one slide, but we're gonna talk about different types of nucleophiles and electrophiles now. A nucleophile is gonna be an electron rich species because it's gonna look for a positive charge you know, on, another, uh, on another molecule. So it can donate a pair of electrons in a chemical reaction. The other way you can define a nucleophile is that it acts as a Lewis base. So remember we defined bases, uh, Lewis acids and bases briefly at the beginning of chapter three. Um, so remember Lewis bases are lone pair donors, or I'm sorry, they're donors of a pair of electrons. And the reason I have to say pair of electrons is because actually a pi bond can serve as a nucleophile. Now a pi bond, the electrons in a pi bond are not a lone pair. They're not localized on one atom, they're shared between two. Uh, but they're far enough away from that atom that they, they, they kind of stick out in space and they can act in, um, in a way as a, a region of electron density uh, that can then attack uh, electrophilic sites. Um, yeah, and then we say here, the more polarizable the nucleophile it is, the stronger the nucleophile is gonna be. 
this word polarizable, um, what that means is basically like how big is the atom that contains the negative charge? The bigger the atom that contains that negative charge, the more, more polarizable it is. Sort of like, think like a, a balloon, basically. Like if you have a bigger atom that has more electrons, those, uh, those the, the lone pair that's responsible for the negative charge is distributed over a wider space. So it's more polarizable because it can, it can fit in more conformations. It can, uh, it can be that way. So the more polarizable it is, the stronger it's gonna be. We're gonna go over these terms again in chapter seven, uh, but for now, that's what we kind of wanna um, keep in mind is like the stronger the nucleophile, the bigger the atom that contains that charge. So here's just a few examples of nucleophiles. We mentioned already this lithium methide uh, species. Well, basically this, this CH3 minus is almost a, almost a carbon ion basically with a lone pair on the carbon. It's almost an ionic bond. Not quite, but very close. Then you have, for example, ethoxide, which is the conjugate base of ethanol. Both of these can act as um, nucleophiles because they both can contain lone pairs on these oxygen atoms. Now, if you were to guess like which one's gonna be stronger, what do you think is gonna be a stronger nucleophile? What's gonna want the positive charge more between ethoxide or ethanol? And think why. Pause the video. Okay, I hope you figured out. The ethoxide is going to be a stronger nucleophile because it's got a full negative charge on this molecule. And that negative charge is mostly, is essentially localized on the oxygen atom. So, uh, so the ethoxide oxygen lone pair is going to be a much stronger nucleophile than is the ethanol lone pair. And then I already mentioned here, this pi bond here, this pi bond can act as a nucleophile. So that's something to look out for when, you, when it comes to that. Now, electrophiles are the opposite. So these are anything that has like an electron deficiency. So anything that has a partial positive charge or a full positive charge. Um, so carbocations, for example, those are fully positively charged, right? They have a positive formal charge. So those are always gonna act as electrophiles. And this is where it brings up, uh, when we talk about the hybridization of these uh, carbocations earlier. And I think chapter two, uh, these carbocations end up with uh, an empty p orbital, that empty p orbital can act as a Lewis acid and accept electron density from a nucleophile. And that's what's going to happen, basically. We're going to see that a lot in just the rest of, the rest of our organic chemistry lives, anyway, for the, the rest of the year here, basically. So in other words, if we're identifying electrophiles, we look for any carbons that are partially positive charge, or really any atom that has a partial positive charge, or any atom that has a positive formal charge and act as an electrophile as well. Okay, so here's our first practice. Let's go ahead, let's label, let's take this molecule here and you can look over the summary here real quick. Uh, in the summary, it kind of gives you an idea of what you're looking for. And then up here, what we're gonna do is we are going to identify all of the uh, electrophilic sites and nucleophilic sites. So I'm gonna be, I'm gonna put um, nucleophilic in red and then in blue, I'm gonna circle the ones, oh, sorry, here, hold on. So uh, that's annoying. So here, we're gonna put a nucleophilic in red, and let me get a new text box here. You can't handle two colors in the same text box. And then uh, the new text box, electrophilic, I'm gonna circle those atoms in blue like that. So go ahead, this is a good time, pause the video. When I restart, we're gonna have everything circled and we'll like talk through the relevant nucleophilic and electrophilic sites. So go ahead, pause it. All right, let's walk it through. So starting from the easy ones, I would say, note that like anything, any atom that has a positive formal charge is gonna be electrophilic. In other words, it's an area of low electron density that can, you know, accept more electron density. So it's gonna act uh, electrophilic. Um, and then anything with a negative formal charge is gonna be the opposite, it's gonna be nucleophilic. That's an area of high electron density. So that's like this oxygen over here. It's gonna wanna attack a, um, a electrophilic site to kind of fill in the electron density. Um, let's see here, so let's now go through it. And basically from there, what we wanna do is look at, okay, we've got pi bonds. So pi bonds here, here, and here, those all can act as nucleophiles. So we can just circle those as nucleophiles right away. And uh, then let's look at the uh, electronegative atoms. That's gonna be, you know, basically, that's gonna determine where our polar groups are. 
So like here we have an alcohol, an OH group. So the oxygen electronegative is two lone pairs. Those can act as nucleophiles. Meanwhile, it's um, bonded to a hydrogen. So it's pulling electron density away from that hydrogen and this carbon. So those are both gonna be electrophiles or electrophilic sites, you could say. Uh, so meanwhile, this oxygen here in this carbonyl, this ketone, um, it's electronegative. It's pulling electron density away from the carbon that it's bonded to. So this carbon is gonna be electrophilic this oxygen is gonna be nucleophilic. Then we have the nitrogen of the amine that has a lone pair and it's an electronegative atom. It's pulling electron density away from a carbon and two hydrogens. So it's gonna be nucleophilic. And then this carbon and these two hydrogens are gonna be electrophilic because they're missing their electron density. Uh, and then, okay, next up, this is a really interesting group over here where we have sort of a ketone that is uh, substituted with a methyl group up here. So this is sort of an interesting scenario where even though oxygen is electronegative, in this case, uh, it's got a positive formal charge. So it's missing some of its electron density. It's not likely to act as a nucleophile, even though it has one lone pair, because it doesn't want to give up those electrons to form a new bond. So this is an electrophilic oxygen with this positive formal charge. Now that said, it's still bonded in polar bonds to one, two other carbons. So the normal rules still apply where this oxygen is more electronegative than these carbons. So it's pulling electron density away from them. So these carbons are gonna act as electrophiles. These are electrophilic sites. Um, lastly, over here, we've got uh, this carbon. It's bonded to an oxygen. Oxygen, again, more electronegative. It's pulling electron density away. And um, that means that it is going to be an electrophilic site. Now, actually, I realized as I was talking about this here that I did miss one here. So bonus points to you if you figured out this one. Uh, there is one um, nucleophilic site that I missed on here. And in particular, I'll just go ahead and circle it here. It is this carbon right here. So I want to point out this carbon in particular. It's not a more electronegative atom. It doesn't have a lone pair, at least as how we've shown it here. But it can still act as a nucleophile. So go ahead, pause the video, try to puzzle out why you think that carbon could be nucleophilic now that I'm telling it to you. And I promise that we've covered, it's something that we've talked about before this semester. So you do know it in your heart of hearts somewhere in there. And then when you're ready, let's walk it through. Okay, so one word answer, resonance. So in this case, we have a pi bond here, right? We have an alkene, and then we have an oxygen with three lone pairs in the allylic position. So you know what that means. That means that um, these lone pairs here, uh, any, any three, you know, any of the lone pairs here are, uh, they, they have resonance. They're allylic lone pairs. So you can draw a resonance structure like this, where we form a new carbon oxygen pi bond that breaks this carbon carbon pi bond and puts a lone pair on this carbon. So in that resonance structure, we have a carbanion here. That carbanion can act as a nucleophilic carbon. So that's just something to keep in mind. Like whenever you have a resonance structure, you know, uh, in this case, this negative charge is actually smeared over both this oxygen and this carbon. So this oxygen can be nucleophilic and this carbon can be nucleophilic. So again, bonus points if you got that without me mentioning it. Um, okay, so all right. So now let's, let's dive in. So we need to talk about nucleophiles and electrophiles so that we can actually talk about basically like one of the most important parts of organic chemistry. This is something that I, I guess I keep saying this all the time, but this is like, this is the foundational part of organic chemistry one and two. Like we're gonna be learning mechanisms and how to, how to move electrons around for the rest of the year. So just keep in mind, like this is something that's really important. Um, so remember already that we learned this in basically uh, chapter three, I think. We talked about how curved arrows show electrons moving uh, when bonds break and then bonds form. And we're, we've seen it before in terms of acid-base reactions where we have a proton transfer. And what that looks like is basically you have the lone pair of the base attack the proton that forms a new uh, bond between the base and the proton forming the conjugate acid. And at the same time, the proton uh, acid uh, bond breaks. So it's, it's plucked from the acid and you form the conjugate base over here. Uh, so in these polar reactions, so these polar reactions involve nucleophiles and electrophiles. 
there's four patterns for how we're going to use these uh, uh, electron um, curved arrows. And they look like this, basically. Number one, we have nucleophilic attacks. Number two, loss of a leaving group. Three is proton transfers. That's what we've covered in acid-base reactions. And then the last one is something that's a little weird, but we'll, we'll talk about it a lot. It's called a rearrangement reaction. And these are the four primary ways that we can move electrons around in our reactions. Okay, so first up, uh, the first type of pattern is gonna be nucleophilic attack. So make sure, you know, take your notes on this. Like we, we wanna make sure that when we draw these curved arrows and these mechanisms, they fit one of these four patterns, you know, 99% of the time. Um, so in the nucleophilic attack, this is where we have a lone pair from a nucleophile attacking an electrophile. Now, why does that happen? Well, the nucleophile is an area of high electron density. The electrophile is an area of low electron density. So just like a water rushing down a hill, uh, the water goes from area of high gravitational potential energy to low gravitational potential energy. Likewise, we're getting a, a region of high electron density that needs to be spread out into an area of low electron density in the electrophile. And so what happens is we form a new bond. So the way that we draw it is the arrow starts, in other words, the tail starts from the lone pair on the nucleophile, and it points to the atom uh, that has the uh, electrophilic end, so the positive charge or the partial positive charge. Now, in this final um, bit here, you know, the products are gonna be a situation where now the atom that was the electrophile is now sharing um, electron density with the atom that was the nucleophile. In other words, you create a new bond. So yeah, they, the electrons are shared, they're not transferred. That's kind of what we wanna say there. Uh, now keep in mind, it's not that this is the end of the world. Like it doesn't, the reaction doesn't necessarily just stop with a nucleophilic attack. Sometimes you're gonna have nucleophilic attacks that have to be followed up with a pro, uh, proton transfer, for example. That's a really common scenario. Like here we have an alcohol. We mentioned before that alcohols can act as a nucleophile because the oxygen has a lone pair. So the lone pair, region of high electron density, acts as a nucleophile. We also mentioned that the carbonyl can act as a electrophile because this carbon is partial positive charge. So again, the electrons um, go from the nucleophile, they attack the electrophilic carbon, and at the same time when that happens, um, you have to break the carbon oxygen pi bond or you would break the octet rule, right? So now all of a sudden we move this lone pair up to the, um, uh, up to the more electrophilic, I'm, I'm sorry, more electronegative oxygen. So it's like, we're, we're just showing here, we have the nucleophilic attack on the electrophile. Then to satisfy the octet rule, we have to break this carbon oxygen pi bond. That oxygen carbon pi bond is transferred. Those electrons are transferred to the oxygen. And so you get a product that looks like this with a negative formal charge on this oxygen, positive formal charge on this oxygen. Now keep in mind again, this isn't the end of the mechanism here. This is just our first type of, uh, type of arrow that we draw. So we know that uh, what's gonna happen is basically next, you're gonna have proton transfers, right? You're gonna have a proton transfer from the uh, positive formal charge oxygen. And then we probably will end up with a proton transfer to the uh, negatively charged oxygen up here, negative formal charge oxygen. And yeah, so the second arrow here, you could think of it as a resonance arrow. Remember, if carbon is bonded to a more electronegative atom, pi bonded, I should say, then there's a fair resonance structure where you have a positive formal charge on the carbon and a negative formal charge on the oxygen. Uh, this was one of the resonance patterns that we talked about. So you could imagine it this way. Now, you don't have to draw this extra structure here. You can just do both arrows in one, in one go, and that's fine. I think I'll save you a little bit of time. Okay, now we also mentioned that uh, pi bonds can act as nucleophiles. The way that works in a nucleophilic attack is, rather than starting from the lone pair, now we're starting from the pi bond. The pi bond attacks whichever atom acts as the electrophile. And in that case, you form a bond between one of these two carbons and the new atom. In this case, it, we could form the carbon sulfur bond on this carbon or the carbon sulfur bond on this carbon. The only thing that changes is basically, oh, we end up with a positive, um, formal charge, uh, basically a car carbocation here uh, on the other atom. So just keep that in mind. 
So basically only one of the carbon atoms uses that pair of electrons. The other one ends up as a carbocation. Okay, so that's the first pattern. Uh, next up we have what's called the loss of a leaving group. Loss of a leaving group looks like basically the opposite of a, um, the opposite of a nucleophilic attack. So whereas before like we formed, uh, we formed this bromo, uh, um, this tert-butyl bromide over here when we had a nucleophilic attack of our bromide ion onto our carbocation. Uh, the loss of a leaving group is where basically you take a, a bond and it's broken heterolytically. So the more electronegative atom is going to take the electron pair with it, leaving you with a positive formal charge on the atom that doesn't get the electrons and a negative formal charge on the atom that takes the electrons with it. Uh, now, this is a pretty complicated one down here, but this is an example uh, where you can actually have uh, multiple curved arrows in order to explain why a leaving group leaves or to allow a leaving group to leave. So like, for example here, this is basically all resonance structures down the board because if you lose this leaving group, that gives you a carbocation here. This carbocation is in an allylic position. So this, um, this pi bond can flip over, leaving a uh, carbocation here. Well, this carbocation is again allylic with this carbon nitrogen bond. So that can flip over here. And now that would give you a positive formal charge on this nitrogen or a double positive charge on this nitrogen. So then what you do is you form a new pi bond from nitrogen to oxygen here. And that's like a, that's one way that you could do that. So we'll, we'll do some more examples of that later on, but that's just to give you an idea of like, these are the types of um, uh, uh, steps that we're gonna see in the future when we have loss of a leaving group. That'll be more specific to um, specific mechanisms. Okay. Next up, proton transfer. This one's easy, right? We've already talked about proton transfer. You know that you have um, a curved arrow from the lone pair of the base pointing at the proton. That forms a new bond from the base to the proton to form your conjugate acid. And in the meantime, you break the uh, bond between the proton and the, the acid, and you're left with your uh, conjugate base on the other hand. So in that case, that would be water over here. So this should look familiar. This is what we learned in chapter three. Now, sometimes, uh, because we're gonna do this a lot, uh, basically a lot of organic chemistry ends up requiring a proton transfer from one atom to another. What we do instead is uh, we just kind of like say minus H plus. So rather than like having to draw out all these arrows here, instead what we do is we just say, okay, this is gonna lose an H plus. It's just gonna be an acid base reaction because this is something that's so common that we see it all the time. So yeah, again, rather than drawing it out necessarily, we can just use minus H plus to say, oh, it loses the proton. And we just use this as our loss of a leaving group. Um, uh, loss of a leaving group, basically, um, sense of this acid base proton transfer. Uh, now, just like what we saw with the loss of a leaving group, the, we often see multiple arrows um, to show how electron density flows uh, with the acid base proton transfer. So like here, for example, when we deprotonate acetone, we're deprotonating what we call the beta hydrogen here. So that gets deprotonated. Now that would form a carbanion, but this carbanion is actually in an allylic position to this carbonyl group. So you know that this carb carbanion would then form a resonance structure where you get a carbon-carbon uh, double bond and then a single bond to a negative formal charge oxygen. So again, this is something that's gonna be more specific uh, but we'll, we'll have some examples of this um, to go over both in the lecture activity and then again when we talk about a, like all the different reactions that we have to cover this semester. Right, so yeah, it's, it's basically, well, this is what I already said here, right? It's like a proton transfer plus resonance where you get this carbanion. This carbanion's in an allylic position so it can form um, an alkene that's then bonded to um, uh, negatively formal charged oxygen. Okay, so hopefully those kind of make sense. Now we're gonna do one that doesn't necessarily fully make sense, but um, it happens. So this is something that's kind of new, uh, but it's, it's something that's gonna explain a lot of the reactions that we see in the future. And this is what's called a rearrangement. In particular, what we're talking about with rearrangements is we're talking cations. So I mentioned this very briefly before, 
uh, when we talked about um, allylic carbocations. Um, but basically, there's a certain degree of uh, stability with carbocations. And basically what it is, is the more substituted a carbocation is, the better it is. In other words, the more carbon-carbon bonds stretch out from the carbocation, the more stabilized it is, because it is stabilized through something called hyperconjugation. So here, this carbocation is an example of what we would call a primary carbocation. This primary carbocation is bonded to one other carbon. So primary, think of that as number one, um, that's bonded to one other carbon. Secondary, a secondary carbocation would be bonded to two carbons. So you might have a methyl group here and a methyl group here. And then a tertiary would be bonded to three carbons. So that's one, two, three methyl groups, for example. And as it turns out, having this carbon-carbon uh, bond to this methyl group is going to stabilize this carbocation through something called hyperconjugation. Now, uh, hyperconjugation just means basically the bonding orbital between the the carbon hydrogen bond and then the empty uh, carbocation p orbital, uh, there's basically a little bit of overlap that amounts to something like a pi bond. It's not exactly a pi bond per se, it just is like you have electron density here that can fill into this hole over here. And so that's good. Like again, you, the more, the more uh, smeared out you have that positive charge uh, by moving in electrons, the better, more stable your carbocation is going to be. So as we increase the number of methyl groups or the, just the number of carbon-carbon bonds around it, that increases the stability of the carbocation. And so it goes like this, basically. You have the methyl carbocation, which is not stabilized by hyperconjugation at all, and in fact is um, extremely unstable. So we don't really see this one. Versus the primary carbocation, which is only stabilized by one uh, carbon-carbon uh, bond. Uh, whereas the secondary carbocation is stabilized by two carbon alkyl groups, and then the tertiary carbocation is stabilized by three. So that's the best. So in other words, it's just, it's more thermodynamically stable to have a tertiary carbocation than it is to have a secondary carbocation than it is to have a primary carbocation. Yeah, because again, you just, you increase the number of the carbon hydrogen sigma bonds that can overlap with that empty p orbital and shove a little electron density into it. Okay, so now that brings up rearrangements. Basically, carbon-hydrogen bonds can actually move. Now, this breaks one of the rules that we talked about before, but, you know, this, basically, we set up all the rules before so that now we break them in the, the ways that actually occurs. So what this is is basically um, uh, carbocations can rearrange in such a way that they form a more stable carbocation. So here, this carbocation is bonded to one, two other carbons. That's a secondary carbocation. Now that's okay, that's somewhat stabilized, but if we look, its neighbor, it's actually, the neighbor is bonded to one, two, three carbons and one hydrogen. So what happens is this carbon hydrogen bond actually shifts over, just like the whole thing, that whole bonding orbital shifts over and it's gonna form a carbon hydrogen bond on this secondary carbocation. And that's going to give us a more stable tertiary carbocation, just like that. Yeah, I know that seems magical, but it happens. Now, I hope you're sitting down because uh, you're watching this video. I'm about to really blow your mind. Not only does that happen with carbon and hydrogen bonds, that can happen with carbon methyl group bonds as well. So now we see that this is basically like a tert butyl group on this secondary carbocation. So you might think there's no carbon hydrogen bond, so no hydride shift can occur, and you'd be right. But actually, this stabilization is so important that this whole methyl group can shift over. And this methyl group shifts over that covers up this um, uh, carbocation, the secondary carbocation, and that gives us a new tertiary carbocation. The tertiary carbocation is so stable that uh, this reaction actually will occur and will occur spontaneously. So uh, a couple things to note. The rules are basically the shifts only occur from an adjacent carbon. So you can't shift to a carbon that's farther away. It's only going to shift over um, one carbon at a time. Uh, and it's only going to form if you form a more stable carbocation, right? So for example, you might think, oh, well, this carbocation could shift to the left or to the right and down, basically. But if we shifted down here, that would give us a primary carbocation. And a primary carbocation is less stable than a secondary carbocation. So that's not going to occur. 
Um, also, I want to point out here, hydride shifts are much more likely than methide shifts uh, for the same reason that like moving your toaster is a lot easier than moving your refrigerator. Uh, just a, a, a hydrogen atom is a lot less massive. So this carbon hydrogen bond is a lot less massive than this um, methide group here, the CH3 minus that shifts over in this case. Okay, all right. So now let's go ahead and look at it here. We've got three examples of carbocations. Um, and I wanna ask you, you know, will these undergo rearrangement? And what would the product of that rearrangement be? Draw the reaction arrow and product if necessary. Give it a shot. Um, now, one thing I forgot to mention actually, going back up here, is that um, in addition to like secondary and tertiary carbocations, you also have another type of stabilization, which is allylic carbocations. So just keep in mind that an allylic carbocation is more stable than a non-allylic carbocation. That's something that also comes up every so often. So let's go ahead, go ahead, pause, pause the video, and uh, we'll go ahead and, well, you know what? Okay, here's, here's what we're gonna do. Let's go ahead and do the first one together, and then we'll work, I'll let you guys work on the second and third, and I'll show you the answers in a second. But let's just go ahead and start with this carbocation here. Now, the first thing that you wanna do is identify what type of carbocation it is that you have. So you'll notice, okay, this carbocation is, is this one here, right? This is the carbocation. It's bonded to one, two other carbons. So this is a secondary carbocation. And usually we say two prime. I honestly don't even know if I can say, I'm just gonna do a two prime carbocation. Normally you use the degree symbol, but that can be really hard to type out. You probably know that already. Um, but yeah, this is the secondary carbocation. So then we have to look and see, is there any hydride or methide shift that can occur to make a more stable carbocation. So there's two types of things that could be more stable than a secondary carbocation, a tertiary carbocation or an allylic carbocation. We don't have any pi bonds here, right? So we don't have to worry about the allylic thing. Um, but let's go ahead and see. So, so we've got two neighbors, right? So we've got, I'm gonna draw in the hydrogens over here. Right, so we've got this neighbor here and this neighbor here, because we know that these methide and hydride shifts can only occur one carbon over. So that's kind of important that we need to know. Um, so now we imagine, let's just imagine real quick, like let's say that the hydride shifts from this neighboring atom over here uh, and it does that, what do you form? What kind of carbocation is this one then? It is secondary, right? So as I said, it's only gonna happen if you form a more stable carbocation. Well, a secondary carbocation is the same stability as a secondary carbocation. So that's not gonna happen. So let's go ahead and get rid of that. Now this carbon here is tetravalent, right? It's bonded to four other carbons. So it's not gonna, it's not gonna form, um, it's not gonna have a hydride shift occur, but it's got two methyl groups. So either of these methyl groups could shift over. Let's go ahead and imagine that. Again, you draw the reaction arrow starting from the carbon-carbon bond or the carbon-hydrogen bond, and then you point at the carbocation to indicate where it's going. Okay, and let's go ahead and draw the product. So we've got a cyclohexane. We moved over a methyl group to this carbon. Oop, there we go. And we have a methyl group on this carbon. Okay, and that's a positive formal charge on this one, like that. Okay, now what kind of carbocation did we form? We formed a tertiary carbocation. It's more stable. This happens. Okay, so that's the kind of like, um, that's, the, that's the kind of analysis you have to do on these rearrangements. Now, obviously right now, I'm just giving you the carbocations in the future. What you're gonna do is you're gonna have these long strings of mechanisms. You're gonna have a carbocation in the middle you need to be able to identify the rearrangement right in the middle. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so I'll go ahead, let you guys do these next two problems. Um, pause the video, and then uh, when you uh, resume the video, I'm gonna have the answers up for you. So go ahead, pause. And we are back. So I hope you guys got these answers right here. Uh, so for the first one here, we know this positive charge, I know it's kind of hard to see, Try to draw it better on the test for you guys, but this positive charge is pointing at this carbon right here. Well, that is a tertiary carbocation. I mean, there's nothing really more stable than that other than like an allylic tertiary carbocation. So there's nothing, nothing could rearrange, right? If we moved a 
the hydrogen from one of its neighbors, we'd form either a secondary carbocation or a primary carbocation. So it's just not going to happen. So no rearrangement possible. So no, no answer there. Now, this is the fun one here on the end. I mentioned already that allylic carbocations are more stable than non-allylic carbocations through resonance. So this is an example of exactly that. We have a secondary carbocation, and it looks like the neighbor, if we form that carbocation, would be secondary. But if we actually do that, we see it is secondary, but it's an allylic carbocation. So sure enough, this, uh, this hydride shift will occur because it forms a more stable allylic carbocation. And we get these two possible resonance structures with that allylic carbocation. So go ahead, ask your questions uh, down below. We've got some more practice as well in the lecture activity. And I think we have a couple more practice problems here. I, I wanna make sure that I put them in the right order here. So let's just check out. Okay, here. So for this one, you wanna go back through your patterns and identify what is the pattern of each of these arrow pushing steps and see if you kind of get the idea of this um, kind of kind of the different patterns. Remember we had four different patterns, uh, nucleophilic attack, loss of a leaving group, proton transfer and rearrangement. So try to classify each of these four. Um, you can pause the video now, go back through your notes, and when I bring the video back up, we'll have the answers. So go ahead, pause. And we are back. So first up we note, here we have this acid on this cyclohexane, and this, uh, this basically shows a bond, a sigma bond being broken, being pushed onto this oxygen here, and that oxygen leaving as water. So that's a loss of a leaving group. Here, this one, this is acetone being protonated. So it counts as a proton transfer. Uh, I also would accept nucleophilic attack here if you answered that way, because this is absolutely a nucleophilic attack. It's just part of a proton transfer. So I think either classification would be okay for this uh, step, this particular step. Uh, next up, we have rearrangement. So here, this is a carbon hydrogen bond shifting over to produce a more stable carbocation. Um, and that's a one, two hydride shift. So that is a rearrangement. And then finally, we have the bromide attacking the carbocation, perhaps from this step, who knows, uh, but that's a nucleophilic attack. Okay, uh, now actually I realize this is in the wrong place. We're gonna cover this one when we cover at the end of the next lecture. So that's all for now. Uh, again, we have more activity practice down below. If you move on to the next lecture as well, it's a relatively short one. We're gonna talk about how we combine all those different arrows together to give us the mechanisms that we're gonna study for the rest of the year. So I will see you soon and uh, have fun.